Good afternoon, everyone. We are just waiting for a few moments as all our attendees log on. So we, we'll start momentarily. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. You are all very welcome this afternoon to our Sloan Care webinar. I'm Gronje Healy, Chair of the Sloan Care Citizen and Staff Engagement Forum, and I'm delighted you've joined us for today's webinar, the 15th Sloan Care Integration Fund webinar, part of our Learning Network event series. We are taking questions during the broadcast, so if you're asking a question or making a comment, please do indicate who the question is for, and we will make sure to get the answers for you. The chat button, the Q&A button, is at the bottom of the screen, and if you type in a question or a comment there, it comes straight into us. But first off, uh, this afternoon, I am delighted to share a short video message to you from the Minister for Health, Mr Stephen Donnelly, TD. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 15th Sláinte Care Integration Fund Learning Network webinar. I wanted to record this video to thank you for your hard work and for your determination in transforming our health service and our social care service for the benefit of men, women and children right across the country. The Integration Fund projects have innovation at their core, obviously, and it's fantastic to see everyone coming together to learn and importantly to share best practice. Over the last year and a half, there have been over three and a half thousand attendances at these live webinars and an additional 3,000 views catching up online. This really demonstrates the huge appetite to learn and to innovate that exists right across our health service. We're living obviously at a challenging time when bringing care closer to the home has never been more important. Not only are these projects integrating care within communities through technology and creating new care pathways, but they're also crucially freeing up capacity in our health service. They're doing this by promoting hospital avoidance, by preventing emergency department admissions and reducing waiting lists. This is happening in specialities including urology, orthopaedics, cardiology and many more. COVID-19 has demonstrated not just the commitment and the tireless dedication of our incredible health and social care workforce. It has also demonstrated the willingness and the eagerness of our staff to innovate and adapt always for the benefit of patients. The theme of today's webinar is patient impact. The patient voice, of course, is fundamental to our transition to our big goal of universal health care. Uh, and each project showcased today and in previous Learning Network events demonstrates the outstanding work being done to adapt and to provide integrated services, critically, that put patients first. I'm determined to accelerate reform and drive more and more change through integration and through innovation. 
these projects are leading examples of how innovative thinking can bring about meaningful and long-lasting change, how it can empower our population in the care of their own health and keeping people well closer to home for as long as possible. I would like to thank you all again for the work you're doing as we drive towards universal healthcare and to ensure the people of Ireland receive the right care in the right place at the right time. I wish you all the best with your projects as they continue to develop and enhance each patient's experience of our health service, highlighting the work and dedication of staff right across the Department of Health, the HSC and all our partner organisations. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about their impact as we move into the new year. Thank you and Nulig Shana. Thank you to Minister Donnelly for that message of support. And we would like to reiterate your thanks to all six and a half thousand viewers of our webinars. And Minister, we really appreciate you've taken the time to record the message for us today. We're very happy to be delivering these webinars in conjunction with the Health Service Executive and with the support of IFIC, the International Forum for Integrated Care. Slaunchy Care is about providing right care in the right, right place at the right time by the right team. And in these webinars, as the Minister reminded us, you'll hear how the projects funded by Slaunchy Care Integration Funds and some HSE funded work are showing us best practice for healthcare reform and displaying how many have adapted work practices and created improved care pathways while responding to COVID-19. Putting people at the centre of health and social care delivery is key to Slauncha Care. Patient impact is a very important component of the success of the Slauncha Care Integration Fund projects. This webinar will focus on two projects and the impact they are having on patients, their families and carers. Patient care is at the heart of some of the Slauncha Care fundamental principles, helping to drive us towards the goal of universal health care, as reiterated by the Minister just there. Some of these principles include ensuring that the patient is paramount to the planning and delivery of appropriate care pathway development and seamless transitions. That timely access to all health and social care is given according to medical need. Delivering care in the community as close as possible to home for patients and delivering care free at the point of delivery. The Slauncha Care Integration Fund is testing and proving new ways in which we can see these principles in practice, including putting the patient at the centre of service design and delivery. The projects this afternoon show how joined up thinking and working in partnership across stakeholders can help us reach Slauncha Care's goals of shifting care to the community and improving experiences for patients. Our first integrated funds project this afternoon is towards self-care in headache, a community-based model of care supporting patients who suffer from headaches, supporting patients to better manage extreme headaches and migraine. Let's hear now from two of the leaders of this project with whom I spoke earlier. Chest pain. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Orla Hardiman, Professor of Neurology and Head of the Academic Unit of Neurology at Trinity College Dublin, Consultant Neurologist at Bowman Hospital and Clinical Lead of the Neurology Programme in the HSC. Also with me is Helen Cal, the National Project Manager Chest pain is a principal presenting symptom of coronary heart disease and places a significant burden on the emergency department. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Shirley Ingram, Advanced Nurse Practitioner in Cardiology and Maeve Kane, Administrator of the Integrated Community Chest Pain Clinic. You are both very welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Shirley, can I come to you first and maybe you would just tell Tell us a little bit about the background to the project. What problem did you set out to solve, Shirley? Thank you, Grania, and thanks for inviting us to this webinar. 
So um, you're absolutely correct. Chest pain play, does place a huge burden on our ED. In Tallaght University Hospital, about 9% of all visits to ED are with chest pain. And a small proportion of these are actually acute heart disease. So my role as an advanced nurse practitioner is to assess patients with chest pain. And I've been doing that for 10 years in the ED in Tala. And I began to see a pattern emerging that approximately a third of the patients who were sent uh, to the ED with chest pain, the pain was non-acute and they'd already been seen by the GP. Now the GP is placed in a dilemma. You know, they, they can't tell if it's, if it's emerging heart disease or not. And because there's no way of getting patients seen quickly, apart from the ED, that's where patients are sent. And you can imagine then um, low risk, non-acute patients end up waiting hours and hours um, to be seen. Our EDs are bursting um, at the seams at the moment, especially over this pandemic two years, chest pain presentations still continued. So back in um, 2017, I put together a business case and, um, basically what I wanted to do was set up some avenue that was not the ED and I did this and thankfully the Slauncher Care Integration Fund came along and it's enabled me to put my vision into action and the vision is an integrated community chest pain clinic based in primary care we're outside the walls of Tala Hospital here in a primary care centre and I'm the kind of the, the filter between the GP and the emergency department and the hospital. So GPs can refer directly to me once they've seen a patient with non-acute chest pain. Um, and patients to date have been, we've had over well over 500 referrals in just over a year. Um, we have actually succeeded in one of our key objectives, which was to reduce the amount of GP referrals with chest pain to ED, and we've succeeded by reducing that by 15%. And, that's, you know, that, that's, that's a great uh, result yeah. uh, already, Shirley. And will you talk yeah. to me a little bit about, you mentioned GPs, who yeah. else is involved in the wider kind of team along, obviously, with the patients? So the team obviously starts with the patient going to the GP, then the GP can refer to me directly. Um, I could not do this role. I'm an advanced nurse practitioner. In my role, I'm completely autonomous. And I think you need an AMP in a role like this because you're not, you're not within the comfort of the, the emergency department surrounded by a medical team, a nursing team. I don't have bloods. I have my stethoscope and an ECG machine and my own experience, and that's it. Um, but I couldn't do this role without administration. And uh, you'll meet my colleague, Maeve Kane. We have 0.5 admin. I'm a whole time equivalent and we also have 0.5 physiology and that's where the integrated piece comes in with the hospital. So if I feel the patient needs further diagnosis, I can refer the patient over to Tala University Hospital to, to my 0.5 senior physiologist donor um, and this expedites any uh, stress testing that I might require. But a third of my patients haven't required any investigations which is very, you know, it, it shows that the correct use of, of the investigations, especially in at a time when our services are really under demand after two years, of, you know, almost of the pandemic. And in, in terms of setting this up, I mean, it sounds very straightforward, but uh, it was in a pandemic, you know, you're mm. pulling people together. Were there challenges to start with, Shirley? Yes, there were. Um, I mean, initially, uh, we were supposed to start in the February of 2020, but the pandemic came in March and I had to stay in the hospital assessing patients over there. So I wasn't released to the to this service till September. So it was a real rush to get patients in, to get the word out. I mean, without Maeve, without admin support, the, the challenges are little things like patient education, patient information leaflets, parking directions, signage. And when you contact a patient, they're, they're not going to the hospital, it's new to them. I was fortunate because <clears throat> I didn't get here till to September. My colleagues in the heart efficiency service next door had been here since February. They had got over all the ICT, the logistics, even how do you get a pen and a piece of paper? We're not in the hospital, you know? So how do you get a face mask? How do we get our PPE? All of those, there was huge challenges. Um, a lot of the logistics they had kind of um, sorted out and then Maeve helped me and we, we literally, we came here on a Thursday and we had patients the following Thursday. So, right. um, 
yeah, when we put our mind down to it, we we, we got on with it. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And maybe I'll go to your colleague, Maeve. Maeve, as, as administrator of the clinic, tell me a little bit about the results and the outcomes that you've achieved so far. Um, yeah, we've, we've, the outcomes uh, we, we monitor really uh, quite closely. Um, we have targets with regards to the monthly report that we have to submit, um, that Shirley uh, has to submit to Launcher Care each month. Um, as Shirley has outlined, um, the aim was to reduce the, the number of patients going to ED with chest pain. Um, and as she said, that's been reduced by 15%. Um, one of our targets as well was to engage with GPs. Um, and uh, we've engaged uh, with something, um, 400 uh, targets of 400 uh, GPs, uh, 112, uh, sorry, uh, I might need to repeat, um, 112 GPs have engaged our service so far. Um, and um, they are now telling us that our service is, is essential. We have a number of GPs, five or six GPs that regularly, regularly refer to us. So those are the kind of outcomes that we're looking at. And, and tell me, what are the patients saying about the project? Because we're focusing today, really looking at, you know, patient focus, patient experience. What are they saying to you, Maeve? How is it for them? Um, uh, they've actually been really quite active in, in telling us uh, how important they think that the service actually is. Uh, we've had unsolicited um, feedback. Uh, we do have an avenue through our patient advocacy service that gives people an opportunity to send feedback in to any service uh, uh, that we have. Uh, but the patients have been very active in telling us that they generally feel um, that they've been seen, they've been heard, they've been educated, they've been reassured. Um, and that they feel that this this is the kind of environment that they want to be in. They want to be looked after in this small and quiet private place where they can talk about the things that concern them, the reason why they've come to the service in the first place. Um, they feel, again, supported almost by their GP as well because he's, he's engaged with our service and they are happy with the speed of the way that things are going. Um, and they're always generally surprised that there isn't actually any charge for this service. I get asked quite often, is there a cost for the service? And uh, they're actually, uh, they're surprised when I say, no, there isn't. So um, they're very much engaged and they're happy to tell us uh, and very much in that vein. Very good. Um, and earlier on, Shirley, we were talking about, you know, the, the, the post, the half post and just the difference this makes to, to run the service. In, in your uh, view, Shirley, is the project sustainable? Is it scalable? What, what do you think? I think when you listen to the patients and I was reading through the feedback um, and I'm just going to read you one quote here from a patient. Um, and it says this service should be better known throughout our communities. I think it would encourage people to go to the GP about mild chest pain without the fear of being sent to A&E. And to be honest with you, I, I think that kind of sums it up. Is it sustainable? At the moment, uh, Gronya, we are over 570 referrals. I, I'm one person here. So when I'm on holidays, nothing happens. And God forbid something happens to me, everything ceases. So we're kind of a victim of our own success now. As Maeve said, the GPs see this as essential. It, it absolutely is sustainable, but I think we need more AMPs. Um, the, the, the government, the Department of Health launched a report on advanced practice in Ireland, and they want 2% of the nursing workforce AMP level by next year. And I think what this clinic does is it proves um, with our results and with the patient feedback that advanced practice in the community works, it's safe. I've only had to refer a couple of patients to my colleagues in the chest pain service in A&E out of over you know, 500 visits. We diagnose people. So I've diagnosed 12% of the cohort with heart disease in a very timely fashion and then reassured 88% and they've been discharged. So is it scalable? Without a shadow of a doubt, it's scalable. I do believe with the chronic disease management program coming on, there's room for AMP led clinics um, for palpitations, for dizziness, um, for atrial fibrillation in the community. And I do believe that clinics such as this led by AMPs with admin, with physiology can remove some of the caseload from the hospitals as well. Um, post heart attack patients and things like that. So, but, but so, it so would require, it, it yeah. doesn't require much growing yet, you know, mm space we need a little bit bigger space and that's really just because of the pandemic but as i said equipment you know once the ict is there it's it's the people so it's my skill it's mave support it's the physiology support and also 
what's really key to the success of this service is the governance provided by my clinical cardiology department in Tala. So that makes it really safe, my consultant, Dr. David Moore. I mean, we are so supported by Tala, the management, the, the nursing, nurse practice development. You know, it's not just me. Yeah. Um, it's all these things in the background enable me to practice safely here for the benefit of the patient. Very good. And of course, you know, ultimately, that's what integrated community care is about, isn't it? It's that yeah. teams it's, working it's, together mm. and people on the ground like yourself with the specialist experience that you have. Um, so, mm. look, it sounds like you're having great success there. Mm -hmm. um, I wish you every uh, success with it uh, in the future. Uh, and we, we look forward to hearing some of the patient testimonies that I know you're going to provide uh, to yeah, us. We we were supported by the uh, um, McMenamin Trust and the project was, I was awarded a scholarship. So we've actually completed a piece of formal research on the patient experience. So hopefully we can share that with you. That's great. Maeve and Shirley, thank you both very much for all the work you do and thank you for joining us on the webinar. Hi, I would like to share my experience with the Community Chest Pain Clinic in Tala. I was a bit nervous when my GP referred me there for a follow-up, but uh, the nurse practitioner surely put me at ease. She not only referred me back to Tala Hospital for further investigations, but I was just surprised at the way uh, how quick it was to get an appointment at Tala Hospital through the clinic. And uh, Shirley not only kept in touch with me to just follow up on my treatment, uh, she was really great and I, I feel that the chest pain clinic is very useful to the community and um, I would have dreaded waiting at Tala Hospital otherwise for an appointment uh, if my GP had referred me directly uh, for any investigation. Uh, I would recommend the chest pain clinic very much and I would say my experience was very good with them. Thank you. So very fulsome testimony there on the work of the community-based chest pain clinic linked to Tala Hospital. And we'll be speaking a little bit later on to Shirley about that research that she mentioned and finding out the detail of it. Apologies, we did a little glitch uh, at, the, at the beginning there around uh, the videos. Um, so I, I'm going to go back now to um, our other project uh, this afternoon. And this is uh, Towards Self-Care in Headache a community-based model of care which supports patients who suffer from headaches, supporting patients to better manage their extreme headaches and migraine. Let's hear now from two of the leaders of the project with whom I spoke earlier. I am delighted to be joined by Professor Orla Hardiman, Professor of Neurology and Head of the Academic Unit of Neurology at Trinity College Dublin, Consultant Neurologist at Beaumont Hospital and Clinical Lead of the Neurology Programme in the HSC. Also with me is Helen Cal, the National Project Manager of the project we are focusing on here today, Towards Self-Care in Headache. You're both very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Professor Hardiman, if I could come to you first, would would you talk to us a little bit about what was the problem uh, or gap that you had identified that the project is setting out to address? Well, I suppose the gap is that um, about 800,000 people in Ireland have a neurological problem. And we know that waiting lists are, are very important. And there's 21,000 people on waiting lists for a neurological appointment in Ireland. And when we looked at the waiting list, um, and we, we did a, a, a short survey of the main neurology centers in the country, we identified that between 25 and 30% of the people on waiting lists for a neurological appointment were, were, um, had been referred because of headache, headache or migraine or, or a variant thereof. And then we also looked at the number of people coming into the emergency room and people who are coming into the medical assessment units. And we identified that headache was, I think, around the seventh most common reason why people were coming to the emergency room, and the second most common reason in some hospitals for their attendance at the um, medical assessment units. So it's a massive problem, um, and it's a problem that when we engage with our colleagues in the Migrant Association of Ireland, that we identified that some of the things that um, 
people were coming to the migraine to, to, to the emergency rooms and to, to the clinics could probably be addressed more effectively if we joined up the care uh, between what we would provide as neurologists, what our colleagues in nursing might be able to provide, and what the voluntary organization might be able to provide with the considerable and wide expertise that they have as a professional um, voluntary organization that's been in operation really since the 1990s. Uh, so this is a, a collaboration that we put together and um, looking at we, what we thought the needs would be for people coming into um, the healthcare system with headaches or migraine and then looking at the patient journey or trying to identify what the journey would look like and trying to identify the inflection points where we would be able to help people to to manage their headaches and and in in doing so to to really um apply the aspirations of Sloan to Care, which was to provide the best type of care um, with the best quality and the best outcomes, but as close to the community as possible. Right. Um, so right. that, that was that was the need that we identified. Very good. Thank you for that. And Helen, can you talk to me a little bit then about this, you know, multidisciplinary teams that are involved and indeed the wider stakeholder group involved in the project? Of course. Um, so this was, it was a national project, as Professor Hardiman has said. Um, so it is an ambitious project from the get go with multiple acute sites, but also in partnership with the Migraine Association and the Irish Pharmacy Union. Um, and each site had a clinical nurse specialist, a neurologist, a part time psychologist and either administration or data person. So a bit busy and each site was encouraged to set up their own project teams under a governance group with representation from each site. So that was the structure of the project. And, I and the three sites are? The three sites are Galway, um, Tala and St. James's. OK, right, right. So many different teams and then the links out into the community. How does that work? Is that through advocacy groups like the Migraine Association? How does how does that work? Yes, that's that, so we've mm. increased those links in the community. So through multiple, so from a psychology perspective, they've set up group work. So there's a nine week um, group session available to people in the community. And like Prof Hardiman has said, trying to treat people in the community so they don't need to come into the acute services. Mm -hmm. So there's full support from everybody from the, the pharmacy union was linking in that we referred patients out to pharmacy, the migraine association. It was kind of joining up the acute services um, with the migraine association to access all of the great services they already provided and strengthen that with the new staff that are now in place like the psychologists. So basically it's just streamlining and each site had different challenges and different needs. So Professor Hardiman had envisaged that to some extent and they were allowed adapt to within their own needs. So and that was really helpful as the project evolved. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd say that must be crucial. The idea that, you know, you're not straight jacketing everybody into doing things your way, but rather looking at how they're doing things. Well, so, Professor Hardiman, what are some of these new care protocols and patient well, pathways that you've well, devised? Well, I think the first thing to do is if you want to engage in change management, you have to know what's happening already. So, so the pathway now looks like um, the general practitioner um, identifies somebody who has a, a headache problem that can't be managed within the community. And the Migrant Association, along with, with my colleague um, Martin Rutledge and others, had worked very hard, Mary, Dr. Mary Kearney as well, had worked very hard to um, notify and identify um, uh, the, the skill set that GPs needed to, to manage headaches. So people were coming to AE and coming into outpatients were people that, that had gone beyond the point where general practitioners would be comfortable managing. Mm. So, so within the scheduled care pathway, we've been using our learnings from the migraine um, at solitary care program. So the patient would be identified by the general practitioner and, and our plan ultimately would be that the general practitioner would then make a communication with the trained nurse that we have, the nurses that we have in the three centres and that the nurse then would be able to identify a triage pathway. So this is happening at the moment where the patient comes into the clinic and um, Miriam, Miriam, Professor Galvin has very nice data showing that the triage pathway has moved from the doctor making the decision to the nurse making the triage pathway, demonstrating an evolving competence within the specialist nursing program. The nurse then would, would perhaps identify the need um, from an investigation point of view that could then be administered within the community through uh, the community access to diagnostics. And that, that's been happening to the NTPF in, in the last year or so with, with COVID. So the patient would then 
uh, be able to present to the outpatient service um, with the appropriate diagnostics and a care plan, plan be put in place, that, that this could be undertaken by a nurse-led clinic because the nurses are sufficiently trained. And then there's a, there's a, a point where it may well be that many of the problems that the person is having and manage them, managing the migraine relate to both the stress of having a chronic illness or chronic condition, the stress of pain management, and perhaps other psychosocial stressors or, or um, mood-related problems. 38% of people with migraine will have a depressive disorder at some point in their lives. So referral over to psychology, and then in some cases one-on-one, -on -one, and in some cases referral uh, for group work, or long to engage with the Migrant Association of Ireland. So, so we're talking about um, kind of a heightened involvement and understanding from GPs, advanced nurse practitioners, and then the idea of the, the better self-management in the community involving, again, GPs, uh, local uh, nurses, and then also hopefully, um, as you say, pharmacists who, as we know, uh, play a huge role in most of us. That's our first point. You go in, I have an awful headache. I've taken Panadol. What do you think I should do? Well, I, I think with respect, you, you've left out a really important actor in this in this scenario and it's something that we we need to really um pay attention to in the irish healthcare landscape which is a voluntary organization because because the migrant association of ireland is is one of the really well-run voluntary organizations and uh, perform a really really valuable service for people with migrants so one of the things that this project does is it stitches together something that 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 um in practice works very well, but but we don't acknowledge. So so this program is a full partnership between the healthcare, the health service executive, and the volunteer organization in very the good. Volume Mining Association. And I think that's really important because yeah. that, that's something that that it, it it's not only is it a very valuable organization that that has a lot of knowledge, but it's also um, patient power. It's it, it's a patient centric patient focused program and the needs of, and the, the uh, desires and the, the objectives of the patients are enunciated through the migrant association. And that's yeah, right. very important. Thank you for that. Helen, I'm wondering benefits uh, and the challenges of patient self-management. I know, Helen, you mentioned self-management support groups, uh, patient education is, is important. Um, would one of you like to take that up, benefits and challenges? I think the challenge is, is when you have it in place uh, to learn from that. And I think especially the psychology group um, hit the ground running very early on, structured a program and adapted that program to suit patients. So, for example, they run sessions at lunchtime and in the evening to suit working patients. So it was all very adaptable and flexible as as the as the project evolved. And I think that made it um more patient friendly and we learned from every engagement and that continues so every time we do something we look at it and look at how we can improve it for the next time around so there has been a lot of learnings one of the challenges i think that we need to really engage with that and i think again we can learn a lot from the migrant association is the medical model so so this is a lifelong condition and it's not an illness because you know migrant is <clears throat> A, a pathway within the brain that becomes activated. I get migraine, so you know it's not it's not an illness. Mm. It's, it's it's a wiring variant in the brain that that sometimes causes trouble. Um, so so I I think <clears throat> recognizing this, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of um, the holistic model of management that be, you know once we can establish that the headache is not you know, a brain hemorrhage or a brain tumor, why people yeah. to A&E, mm. but, but some, uh, something that involves both a recognition, understanding what's going on, and then a recognition of, of the person within their entire environment, mm -hmm. um, and that we can manage what's going on um, uh, within our life, within our environment, and not just using the model of, oh, this is a medical condition, I need a doctor. And so that's, yeah. what, so, so that's a challenge too, for us, as healthcare professionals, as well as a challenge for the system to be able to to um, reassure people that the model that we're using is is um, more likely to be beneficial, and that's some of the work that that our colleagues in psychiatry or psychology rather are doing, mm -hmm. along with the Migrant Association of Ireland, and that is something of a challenge still. 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in, I mean, the title of the project is around self-care. So again, you know, the, the historical approach, very much the medical model of, you know, medication, the doctor will tell you what to do. But your explanation there of it as a wiring problem, I think is, is very elucidating, because really it's about what is it that sets the wires off? What is it that you can do to help, you know, reduce that inflammation or singing of the wires or, or dreadful pain? I mean, we know that this is it is quite debilitating uh, when you have a, a migraine so a lot of the pathways around self-management are around i presume recognizing what are your stressors what helps to avoid it and then what to do when you get it and, and using these other professionals that you mentioned is really about having skilled people around you i presume one of the the key outputs you're seeing from this is a you know a reduced footfall into uh, the hospitals that people are being seen. Maybe talk a little bit about some of those results that, that you're seeing, uh, if you yes. would, Professor Hardiman. And some of the materials that we that Professor Galvin has, has generated are are that have, have given us food for thought and, and and have demonstrated something that we need to work with locally within the hospitals. And as as Helen said, our executive uh, for this program comprised uh, the the um, senior administrative and nursing um um, representatives from the participating hospitals and so for example if we look at um, people who come to emergency room 37 percent of people who come to emergency room get admitted with a headache now 37 yeah. percent of people who come to emergency room with a headache don't have a brain tumor and don't have a stroke and don't have reason so so there's there's there, there's quite a lot that we need to do both about um determining why people come to the emergency room in the first place what's what's broken what you know what, what, what's led to that mm. what could we do to circumvent the need to queue up in a &E for 12 or 14 hours uh, and secondly what do we need to do within the hospital setting then to to ensure that uh, that person um is adequately managed um and, but not necessarily brought into a very expensive bed and usually the the data are view if you come if you get admitted it takes it three days even if there's nothing wrong with you mm. to, to get out of hospital again so so we, we need to we need to really understand you know what those pathways are and um, so some of the the ongoing data collection that we've been undertaking where we can see the shit the change there are fixed points that i think we we probably need to drill into a little bit more and and we're, we're still analyzing the data set professor galvin is still looking at those data for us and and identifying the other facets of change management that I think we might want to engage with going forward. Uh, but but I, I, I think so it's a dynamic program. Mm -hmm. We would like to roll this out into the other sites around the country. There are there are 10 um, uh, major neurology hubs within the country and there are also other hospitals that have neurological um, uh, input. And so we'd really like to see this being moved out, this model of how we deliver care for headaches and migraine right into the, the entire um, landscape of, of of neurological care, um, so I, I you know we're, we're working very hard with with the Estros program, the scheduled care program, to make sure that we can do this and that we can continue to collect the data. Actually, it's very important to yeah. to show that um, the changes that we've made, but also to identify where those roadblocks are still because there still are roadblocks. Sure, and uh, roadblocks and progress. Helen, for you, uh, next for the project is that it? Trying the national rollout, bringing it out to other centres? Yeah, well, absolutely. I think even in the centres that are now up and running and established, they themselves will be looking at improvements and what we can do differently. So it's an ever evolving um, and that's really good and a credit to the local teams for doing that. And I think then the transition into mainstreaming for the current sites and the hope that all patients across the country will be able to benefit from it because the feedback has been so positive. And um, there's been a lot of learning, simple things that we never anticipated, like when you appoint somebody geographical space, actually space to run a clinic, space to have an office for somebody. If you're running a psychology service, a busy outpatient may not necessarily be the ideal scenario. So simple things that we probably hadn't envisaged mm -hmm. that we would advise if, if you were rolling it out again of the basics that we need. Access to diagnostics is hugely important. Patients need to come back into the hospital just to get a scan, which if they had it in a more timely fashion either in the community they would not need to come back into this so there's lots of learnings and as professor hardiman has said um professor galvin has a huge amount of work done on the looking at the pathway and we'll continue to learn from that to you know to, to roll out the service further 
Great. So for the moment, can I thank both of you for sharing the information uh, on this really interesting initiative. And I'm sure uh, thanks to you on behalf of the patients, those who suffer from migraine, which is such a debilitating condition, you know, it, hope for the future and better self management leading, uh, as you said, Professor Hardyman, right care, right place, right time. And this sounds to me like it's 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 timely. So thank you again and, and, and well done. Well, we'd like to thank the Sloan Care programme for believing in us and for allowing this project to go ahead. I think it's a really important thing for the 18% the, um, of the Irish population who gets migraine and up to 70% of people get headaches. So I think for, for the entire Irish community, we'd like to thank Sloan Care for, for allowing us to, to initiate this programme to, to manage change for, for people with headache in Ireland. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. From attending the Migraine Psychology Clinic funded by Sanch Care, um, I feel a sense of relief in knowing that there are other people like me who deal with extreme headaches and migraine. It's reassuring to know that my reactions to experiences and challenges are similar to others of the group. It helps to feel like they are justified and reiterating again that these reactions and feelings are valid and normal for what we go through. Thanks to the group, I definitely feel like I can manage the triggers to migraine, thanks to the content that was always so well discussed. I think about my pain differently now because of the group in that it's not as debilitating and world ending as it sometimes felt like. The work in the group has elements of compassion focused ideas, which is definitely helpful at making me feel less guilty if I had to miss an event. I would come away from the group every week feeling rejuvenated and again, feel like the pain I experienced is valid. My name is Claire Mullally and I attend the headache clinic in Tally University Hospital. Um, I've been attending the clinic since 2019 after my GP had referred me there. Previous to that, I have actually been sick for seven years um, since my 30th birthday and I've had no quality of life in all those years um, in my 30s because of all the issues I've had with my head and no hospital no doctors nobody could understand what was happening to me a lot of people thought it was a lot of doctors and professionals thought it was just anxiety and stress um and put it down to that and wouldn't see me and it wasn't until i went to tala and i finally got my diagnosis and i finally got the right medication that things have started to change for me um my local chemist has taken part in the pilot scheme with trinity so they can help me out as well when i'm in a migraine um Everybody that I've met on the team in Tala have been amazing. Um, they'll never know what they have done, just simple little things um, to change my life. And it's still ongoing every day. I'm actually in the middle of a migraine right now. You might not know, but I am. And I'm able to get out of bed and leave the house and do things that I never thought I'd be able to do. Um, also, in the last six months, I got myself a little job. It's a part time job um, and it's amazing because I never thought I'd be able to work again. But for me to be able to understand my migraines all comes from the fact that I attend Tala and also the psychology group that I did with um, Michelle over the summer. I find it really, really helpful to for her to be able to teach us to understand our own migraines. I was able to explain my migraines to other people. So um, that was really helpful in me getting a job as well, because my boss now understands me more because I understand me more. But every part of the clinic at Tala has, has been amazing. So um, thank you to uh, Neve and Claire. Quite moving testimonies, I, I think, a bearing testimony to the impact that the headache clinics have been having on their lives and, and hearty congrats to Claire for securing a new job and improving her quality of life as a result of participation on the program. Well done to the whole team and you know, delighted for the patients who are getting this life-changing outcomes uh, from uh, the project at work. So you've heard uh, from the, the, the two initiatives. Uh, I've now got a, a panel drawn from those working on these projects and we are taking questions and we've had some uh, comments in already and I'll bring those to you uh, as we go through uh, the rest of the afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our panelists this afternoon. We're joined by Audrey Craven, 
president of the Migraine Association of Ireland, uh, Professor Miriam Galvin, Associate Professor of Intersectional Research Methodology, uh, Academic Unit of Neurology and Clinical Medicine, and Shirley Ingram, who we, we've met uh, earlier on, Advanced Nurse Practitioner in Cardiology with the Tally University Hospital Community-Based Chest Pain Clinic, whom we met already uh, this afternoon. And maybe, Shirley, I will just read out a little comment that came in specifically for your project. Uh, Hillary texted in directly to us to say a family member was treated um, it was referred to Shirley uh, post-COVID and cardiac referral. Such an excellent service and waiting times very minimum. Well done to all involved. So Absolutely. lots of support out there for you. Great to see that coming in. So uh, right. thanks to our panellists for, for joining us th this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Audrey, if I could come to you first, if I might, as president of the Migraine Association of Ireland. Professor Hardiman there in, in the video she did with us speaks very highly of the involvement of the Migraine Association. Can you tell us how the Migraine Association and yourself got involved with this initiative and what the input has entailed? You're very welcome, Audrey. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, Groen, and thank you to your team. Well, back in 2000, uh, well, back in the 90s, 94, I was that very isolated person in the darkened room, unable to function, uh, looking after three small children, absolutely desperate, so debilitated, uh, ended up in Bowman Hospital so many times, being dehydrated. But I came to read and understand quite a bit about my migraine. And the World Health Organization classifies migraine as the seventh leading cause of disability globally, the fourth overall for women, which I understand is because of hormonal fluctuations in the female. And for instance, in Ireland today, there are 13,000 people with a migraine attack as we speak, Gronia. Wow. So overall, there are about 800,000 people, as Professor Hardiman alluded to earlier, in Ireland with migraine. And the cost to the Irish economy is estimated at about 252 million due to workdays lost mm. and reduced productivity. But back in 2010, we brought together a multidisciplinary team. GP, pharmacy, um, psychologist, nurse, and the Migraine Association people. And we worked out um, a multidisciplinary program. And in 2011, we brought that to Barry White, a former colleague of yours. I don't know if he's still there. And then uh, Adina O'Driscoll, who was program manager for neurology, she wrote and did quite a bit of work on it. And we were absolutely thrilled when Professor Orla Hardiman became the clinical lead for neurology. And to say that she has been the change in this change management program to give the right treatment to the right person in the right place is an understatement. So we were absolutely thrilled then when that uh, iteration of the program was written up and uh, Dervla Kenny worked on it extensively. And as has already been said, the um, pilots then were rolled out and the Migraine Association and all our members are just so gratified with the progress to date. Very good. And in terms of that, so you're in there, you are the patient voice really around this table, explaining the experience, commenting on uh, the, the approaches in the past, what has worked, uh, what hasn't. Do you think the project has improved access to care for patients? Oh, remarkably, uh, Gronia, absolutely, because um, so many people are undiagnosed, underdiagnosed, missed diagnosed, mistreated, mismanaged. So yes, the first and most important thing is to get a proper, accurate, timely diagnosis and hopefully then a treatment plan. And of course, the medical model we've talked about, but it isn't just the medical model. Mm. You know, we have to be empowered patients too. And we have to take, for instance, um, I we're coming up to Christmas now and I won't be having any alcohol. And a number of people who suffer with severe migraine and severe headache disorders, I mean, people with chronic headache, 
um, have it on 15 days a month. Imagine wow. half your life. So you can see that the access to care is vital to get that diagnosis and get a treatment plan and hopefully then be able to participate and manage your life. Mm. And that element of, you know, patient engagement and empowerment in our own health and well-being. So, for example, saying no to alcohol because, you know, it's going to bring on uh, the, the horrendous pains you don't want to have. What are the other kinds of things? I mean, the women there gave testimony about, you know, that the nine week program they'd been on helped them to understand themselves better. I mean, I, I think it was um, uh, one of the women there who talked about, I think about my condition differently and that really helps talk a little bit about what she what she meant yes, by that. I found I found that a very powerful testimony yeah, yeah. because really um, you feel so hopeless and helpless and you go down into a darkened room and a darkened place, place. in your mind mm -hmm. so this multidisciplinary approach helping thinking differently about your migraine and migraine is never just a headache it's got accompanying symptoms. There's right. no test for migraine. Right. The diagnosis is made on the story told by the patient. So we've talked about alcohol, um, adequate sleep, staying hydrated, perhaps not getting too um, busy, um, giving yourself time to exercise, giving yourself time to get out into the fresh air. So I would say living life defensively, but mm -hmm. living life to the full, because migraine has ruled my life, but it hasn't ruined it. And I think that's the key for a number of people. And for people who, who are caught in that terrible dark place, I think having the information, information is power. Yeah. And then having a team to reach out to, to assist you on that journey. And, and I really think that's vital because that peer-to-peer -peer support and just one of the testimonies there refer to knowing you're not alone. Yeah. Yeah, powerful, very powerful. And and I thought the young woman who spoke about, you know, since she was 30 and she's 37 now, thinking she would never work again. I mean, my God, as a young woman, having that prospect must have been terrifying. So great testimonies, yes. as you say, Audrey. Thank you so much for your work. Could I could I move to Professor Galvin, if I might? Um, I know you've you've been looking at both the methodology and the some of the kind of research uh, outputs from this work. What have you learned, uh, Professor Galvin, about the patient's experience and their journey? Thank you, Gronia. Uh, well, following on from Audrey, I hope, and the testimonials, I think they're better proponents of the experience than, than a lot of the data I will, well, you know, showing is actually coming from the person. So the data that I will show hopefully now and the data that I've worked with was collected from the hospital sites. Great. So it's a different type of experience, but mm. nonetheless, it's an experience. So um, I, I, I'll look, look at a slide shortly, but just to reiterate slightly what we were talking about, it's a mm. national program. Yep. So the, three, the sites that were mentioned, uh, we collected data, thanks to the people in the hospitals, on two and a half thousand individual patients. So we've heard figures uh, from Professor Hardiman, from Audrey and from Helen as to the magnitude of this condition. So two and a half thousand people over a nine month period of time, which is when we started collecting the data. That's quite a good sample of people yep. attending with headache related problems. So we're not saying anything statistical. Mm -hmm the data for, for anybody yep. who's interested in that we can look at that again but i think just more as an overview so the, the slide i'm going to share with you now hopefully um and hopefully everybody can see that um here is that possible can yes it's it's through yeah. thank you That's okay lovely. so what basically this is we can collected information on the green here on the left or who referred you to the hospital on the blue where did you go to on referral from the hospital so I, I've kind of compressed a number of questions here. So if we just take the hospital as a whole, mm. a generic hospital, we're not naming a hospital, it's, it's based on the data we collected from the hospital sites. We asked people in inpatient departments, um, outpatients, um, emergency departments, migraine clinics and Botox clinics, anyone presenting there with headache symptoms was we collected their information. So in general, people refer to any of those hospital sites 39% came from general practice. So that bears out what, what we've been saying. Yeah. Um, interestingly, 16% were self-referred. 
they go to the hospital. Um, of course, there's a fear, and that's been mentioned before, there's a fear of what's going on in my head, etc. cetera. Um, other people uh, have come from clinics or whatever, but the big issue here is the general practitioner and people walking into the hospital. We have collected data on what happens to them in the hospital, but rather than go into all of that at the moment, and I know it's, it's late and people data sometimes is a bit problematic to watch. So I just wanted to show what happens when they come from the hospital. So the specialist nurse is referred to or part of the treatment plan for over a quarter of people in this study. The general practitioner comes back into the picture for over 16%. And if we just look here um, on the lower now, just bear, bear with me on the figures, they're only smaller than these because this is part of the project that we started. They're being included, the migraine association is included in the treatment plan. Uh, pharmacy is included in the treatment mm. plan unfortunately the psychology just began we weren't able to collect data and if i can just suggest what professor hardiman said if we could continue to collect data of this level we would definitely see see a change because this was from december to september over covid etc so this this i hope shows the patient experience through the service in a slightly different way obviously than the patient experiences we spoke of before yeah very good and i was uh... One of the things that uh, Prof Hardiman said that that really struck me as well was, you know, of the 500 visits, 88 percent went off reassured because I think the fear around this condition yes. and that's why people walk into ED because they think I'm, I'm, I'm having some kind of a brain hemorrhage or exactly. and a percentage are. But actually, the vast majority aren't. Uh, and that idea of that they're able to have the treatment, have the advice, have the support, have the work of the specialist nurses back to the GP, the migraine association, Absolutely. the classes, all of that. So, I mean, it really is, um, I, I think it's very interesting. The, the, the other part of the data that you've been collecting is talking about how you might shape future services and yeah. service improvements for patients. And I know, again, that Professor Hardyman was talking about, you know, the, the dream, the plan is to try to roll this out across the other 10 hubs, your neuro neurological hubs, but even wider. So what is your data that you've collected? What's it telling you about mm -hmm. how you might shape these future service improvements? Okay. So um, before I move on to the next slide, I, okay. of which there's two, so people don't have to, to, to freak out, hopefully. Um, just to mention that we have also data on the medications used and what happened to people. And also we know that a number of people who presented to ED, so for example, if those 16% presented to ED, a lot of those people get admitted to hospital. Yeah. And we've already heard from Professor Hardiman that that's a minimum of a three-day stay. Yeah. So we, we've, we've recognized from the data by following the patient that there are certainly bottlenecks within the acute system that can be potentially altered given there. So I just want to go that the data, therefore, we looked at was from, if you, look, if you think of the right-hand column, who prepared this treatment plan? And the data have shown us that if the nurse is involved in the treatment planning, they're more likely to have referred to migraine psychology or pharmacy, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And on our next slide, which hopefully we'll be able to, <laughs> it'll, it'll come up now. I don't, can we see that? Um, yeah, yep. yeah. So this is basically on the bottom here, we see from December when we started collecting data, December 2020, all the way through to September 21, where we finished wow. collecting data. So of everybody, so all of the people we looked at, mm. this shows that the consultant and senior physician naturally was involved in most, or if not all of the treatments, um, at the treatment plans and where to go to. And then the, the NCHD and the regs were obviously involved. But if we look at the specialist nurse involvement over time, you definitely see the greater involvement of specialist nurses month on month, yeah. considering this is COVID, et cetera, and we have stopped in September, so I would imagine it would continue as a result of the project and the involvement of the specialist nurse and the linking with the Migraine Association. It's increased from 11 percent, it was 4 percent in January, and it's now almost 50 percent of people who are who have a treatment plan. It's involves the specialist nurse. And if you link that back to the fact that the specialist nurse refers out to much more community based services and self-management, we can obviously exponentially say that we, we're, we're potentially changing services by changing the configuration of the referral pathway out of hospital. So I think the data we're show, we've collected can show a lot and certainly can show that it can shape future service um, for patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of the implications of that, as you say, absolutely. you know, yeah. lower footfall in the hospitals, uh, less anxiety, faster absolutely. treatment, all of those things. Look, that's, yeah. that's really super work. Thank you. And, and I'll come back yeah. to you with other uh, questions okay. uh, and, and comments. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Shirley, 
back to you. Uh, great uh, to have you with us again, and thank you for the video uh, earlier on. So, Shirley, in terms of the community-based chest pain clinic, you mentioned at the end of your video that you have recently completed some research. Would you share some of the findings of the research with us, if you would, please? Uh, you're on mute there, Shirley. Just unmute yourself. Perfect. Thank you, Grania. Thank you. It's wonderful to hear about that headache project as well, because yeah. along with headache and chest pain, they're the, the biggest presenters That's to the emergency easy. department. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose me as an AMP, I'm passionate about research and audit. Um, you know, I really believe that we have to analyze what we're doing um, to, to ensure that it is doing what we want it to do. Um, and for patients as well in the community, for a lot of the patients I would have seen, it's their first experience ever being in the community. They're usually used to going to the hospital, so that was a big change. And then also, um, patients are not overly familiar with the role of an advanced nurse practitioner outside the acute setting as well. And I, I really am a firm believer in asking the patient what their experience is like. Um, I felt that we needed to reduce the element of bias because I didn't want to be just handing people a questionnaire and saying, fill that in there before you go, because, yeah. you, you know, that, that just would not be uh, correct science. And with GDPR, we have to protect people's data and people's uh, opinions, everything like that. So I was very lucky through our director of nursing, Anya Lynch, um, to collaborate through Trinity College. So I collaborated on this with Dr. Karen O'Sullivan, who's a research fellow in the Trinity Center for Practice and uh, for doc with Dr. Sharon O'Donnell, who's a director of research in the School of Nursing and Midwifery. And um, advanced practice research is very well supported in TALA. So I was very lucky. And, you know, we started looking at, at this at the very beginning of my project. Now, bearing in mind, we've been in a pandemic. We wanted to go to formal ethical approval. So it did take a lot of time. So, um, the, the patient experience really is one arm of a Donna Badian style research framework that we're carrying out over the long term. And it looked at, looks at structure processes and outcomes. So looking at the patient outcomes, we've two arms of the study at the moment. One is patient experience, and that's what I'm going to talk about. We've literally just got our provisional data. We still right. have some results coming in. Um, we're looking at six month outcomes of representation to ED, et cetera. That won't be done until late spring. And should the, pro um, should the project be successfully funded from January, I really would look at to, love to look at the GP experiences mm -hmm. because very few people ask the GP really what their experiences are. So just starting with the patient um, experience. So we designed a questionnaire. It was posted and we also had it on Qualitrix so people could use their phones, um, to, you know, which made things a lot quicker. And we asked patients about everything from literally the directions to park in the car how, how, self they, how uh, safe they felt coming here in the middle of a pandemic, what their reception was like when the appointment was being booked, how long they had to wait, the experience of advanced nurse practice assessment, the diagnostics, their experience with the integrated piece in the hospital right up until their follow-up phone call. Um, and I have to say that we, you know, our Karen has broken down the data initially for us and just looking at taking a first pass at it. It really is about 90% of patients are ticking very good or excellent across all areas. Okay. So for example, um, appointment waiting times 98%. And we, you know, we risk stratify our patients. So as the referral comes in, uh, myself and Maeve, you know, we, we, we booked them in an order of priority. So as Maeve said earlier, patients are delighted to be seen so quickly. Um, Follow-up diagnostics. At the moment in the hospital system, diagnose, diagnostics are uh, hugely curtailed. There's very long waiting lists. Yeah. So I have protected diagnostic slots. So patients where um, if they needed more diagnostics, such as stress testing, it happened within the same week. OK, or if not, within a fortnight and then waiting for results as well, because I phone the patients with the results. They don't have to come all the way back in here. Um, I, I ring them, you know, in the evening time when they're at home, we have a good chat. And because we've had such a good uh, experience at the face to face assessment that, um, you know, that it's easy enough to explain results and things to them. 
um, on the, the clinic. And then the response rate to that was 98%, very positive. And then we looked at confidence in the level of A&P assessment, because it is a very, very new thing. Mm. And people did write on the questionnaire, that doctor, she was great. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think once you have a stethoscope, even though I'm in a uniform, yeah. uh, you know, it's still a big change for the yeah. Irish population um, getting used to advanced practice. But yeah. by and large, um, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that the, the feedback was very positive. People felt safe with me. They felt trusted. They felt educated and confident. And a few people said, said that they really felt that I was able to give them the time. And that's what I have here. Mm. I can allocate my time as I see per, per patient case and per case load. So a few comments that came in, I'll just read from the research where um, one of the best HSC services I've experienced, please, please continue this clinic. Uh, one man called it life-saving. And I think what it has done is it's put a very positive spin on Sloan Care when over the past few months, the media has been less than favorable. So I have, I have a sign here, as you can see. Yeah. People ask, what are you? How are you here? And once you explain this as a Sloan Care integrated, integrated Fund project, it engages people with Sloan Care in a way that they probably haven't been exposed to before. Mm. Um, as the, mm. the, the, the room for improvement, because there's always room for improvement, sure. has been sort of location, signage, things that are beyond my control. I'm based in a primary care centre. I have no ownership of any of those things. Uh, we have done our best. We've designed literature and everything like that. But, you know, it's never going to be perfect. Our waiting area is quite small, things like that. But, you know, the, they're, they're small little issues in, in the grand scale of things. Yeah. And um, I mean, I suppose the other thing uh, from, you know, even from the data that you've 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 presented to us, um, you know, the idea of people, um, you know, I, I love the idea of getting the results explained on the phone, because that idea of sitting in a waiting room, mm -hmm. your heart palpitating in your chest, mm -hmm. adding to your chest pain because yeah. you're waiting on some specialist to give you the results, maybe yes. weeks after you've done the test. Yeah. I mean, somebody you've of, never met before. Someone you've ne mm. never met before. Mm. Whereas that relationship mm. that they have with the ANP, they know when the phone rings, they can see your face as you're yeah. speaking on the phone. So yeah. I think all those human interaction things are hugely uh, important. And I mm -hmm. think you're right about the, you know, the, capturing the GP experience. Because again, yeah. an awful lot of our multidisciplinary mm. um, projects, which involve the GP, they have a mm. huge amount to contribute, but also mm. their experience. Uh, what's helping them? What's hindering yeah. them? How can they, you know, uh, really make a full contribution? So that's um, that's that's super. Um, I'll come back to you, Shirley. I think some comments, uh, further comments coming in. But I have a comment, if I might, go back to um, our colleagues from um, the headache project. Um, just to go back, and there's a, there's a, a question, um, Francis said, the Headache Project is a powerful example of a collaboration between the state, the health service, and the community and voluntary sector service providers. It is so important that this is an equal partnership. Does this potential, does it have potential in other aspects of the health and social care services? Miriam, I might come to you on that one. Um, does it have potential for other health and social care services? I, th I think so, absolutely. I think once we've, um, I mean, evidence base is obviously crucial to, to nursing and as we, as, as Shirley has indicated, and to a yeah. lot of the other professionals. And when once you see something as integrated as this, so it's across different sites. So we've got the actual individual hospital issues we've all the gps in the location yeah. we've the national uh, migraine association we've all these moving parts and through this pilot we've established the challenges to making that work and we're as, as helen has indicated we're learning from that and the benefits of making it work so i mean i'm not saying we can just take this framework and apply it to some other thing obviously sure. it has to be adapted but once we can show it's working and the good bits of it i do think it can be certainly for things like that have to be managed as prof Hardiman said if it's not a medical condition why are we keeping going back to the medical services? It's a health issue yeah, as much yeah. as a medical issue and health and self-management in the community could, you know, for such as Shirley has, has suggested mm -hmm. as well. I mean, this is just, there's such commonality over these projects and the ones that Sloan Shakira has, has supported. Yeah. 
Yeah, but absolutely. I think it would be really interesting to look at the commonalities. Obviously, in Stone to Care, you probably will do that, but to look at the different projects in the different mm-hmm. specialties and see how it could be applied. Yeah, exactly. Because many of the new pathways or protocols actually can be replicated with just with different exactly. Uh, uh, exactly. parties involved. And Audrey, yeah. maybe you'd and like I, to... I have referred Sorry. patients. To Sorry, the Shady. headache, I have referred patients to the headache <laughs> there you go. Uh, service, yeah. and I've referred patients to the heart efficiency service. So it's community referring through community. It is exactly, and the nurse yeah. again being central. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. And, and again, um, there's a comment from Ashling saying, you know, nursing is integral to all of these pathways, which is great to hear, and I think that's true. Or did you want to comment on Francis's comment about, you know, it's really important when we have these collaborations that it's an equal partnership. Do you feel you've been part of an equal partnership? Yes, I think perhaps we've been extremely fortunate with somebody as as unique as Professor Hardiman. Um, The old paternalistic attitude uh, is very much last century. Uh, And I think the equality that you refer to there is an ongoing issue. Um, But I would put in the word there, respect. Mm. And uh, it's really about mutual respect. And um, with that then comes trust. Yeah. And, and, and we all know, certainly, if we didn't understand that before COVID, we understand it now, each and every one of us, the importance of uh, respect for people doing their job and what they mean to us in the community. Yeah. And also the importance of trust, because nothing can be achieved unless you have trust in the person who is conveying it to you. And just one little thing I'd like to add, if I may, Gronje, um, the because of the incidents and prevalence and the so many people never seek help and they go into decline, possibly into to depression and I think there's data to support what I just said I think it's important to remember that a good case history is taken not Mm. given yeah see heads nodding on 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 that uh, all around yeah Yeah, well said Audrey yeah well said can I can I come to you mentioned COVID there we've heard about you know the negative impacts of COVID on on so much of the delivery of care but some of the projects that we featured here over the last year have seen some interesting and unexpected positive outcomes for patient care or patient experience during these challenging times. Have any of you experienced unexpected outcomes arising from the COVID pivoting that you've had to do? Shirley, you're nodding your head. Can I come to you? Mm. Has that been your experience? Yes. So, I mean, we have stayed open. We've, we've, uh, We've never stopped for a day and people were often surprised. So when the traditional outpatient clinics were cancelled in the hospital Mm -hmm. setting, we kept going here. And back in February, when we were at a really high surge, my colleagues in the hospital were in the chest pain service were all redeployed to intensive care. So I took the chest pain patient cohort from the hospital. And so that enabled the hospital pathway. Now I couldn't sustain that long term, but Mm. I was able to take the patients for about a month so I was able to sustain them through the community. Anyone who did go to A&E with chest pain, the discharge pathway was still kept viable there. Right. And that was really important because otherwise, in the absence of the hospital service due to redeployment, those patients might have been admitted mm. and really, yeah. you know, in the middle of, of a COVID surge. So yeah. um, we have just kept going. We just wear <laughs> PPE now. And really, it's been kind of no different. And I think patients are very grateful of that. Also coming to you in that community space Mm -hmm. where you're not going into an ED where you're thinking, uh, particularly maybe, well, anyone, but maybe older patients in particular where the fear in COVID times, that's really interesting. Um, Miriam, did you want to to come in on that point? No, no, I was just just echoing. I think it's, it's, there are some, I suppose, positives if they're built on, I guess. Yeah. Um, But um, I suppose the the, the utility of the virtual consultation Mm. A bit like um, when Shirley was talking as well about not having necessarily to go the whole, you know, she is the front person. And again, in, in this case, we had we had a devolved care, if you like. So there yeah. was the migraine association. Psychology continued. And I think the way most of us have gotten used to uh, whether it'll continue or not, the sort of the location non-specificity, if that's what a very mm. long-winded word, that, I mean, you can still continue a service like a, mm. a group-based psychology service online. Yeah. 
Exactly. You don't have to come along. You don't have to travel. The hospitals, it was redeployment in the hospitals, but still the service, the nurse was there, the migraine association, the pharmacies. So uh, it, the thing is embedded outside of the hospital service. So if, if, a bit like a power cut, I suppose, if one of the systems breaks down, if there's yeah. some other thing we can sort of, and I think that was kind of highlighted as well in our project, that yeah. that's because it's kind of diffuse, if you like, because that's the way we want to manage change. I yeah. think it was useful if we can build okay. on it. That's, that's useful. Audrey, have you further comment along the COVID positive things maybe? Yes, I think <clears throat> going back to knowing you're not alone, mm. uh, the peer-to-peer -peer support, I would say, is vital because uh, one of the, we give information in the Migraine Association of Ireland. We would love to be able to have a qualified person to um, answer the medical questions and over the years nurse Esther Tompkins has been an absolute gift to us um, answering the medical questions and we refer them to our medical advisory board but I think if you have a query with your medication you're in a very bad place you're going through a very bad spell you're unable it's a really about your ability to function because I would get migraine attacks that I could do some routine work and others where I simply couldn't yeah, speak do nothing. or function mm. at all mm. Mm. so so it's the degree of severity and frequency but I do think it, it, highlighting the things we've learned during COVID is the importance of say telemedicine having somebody there that you can check in with yeah. and being able to um, say it can, can you reassure me on this? Can you point me in this direction to signpost you? Um, mm. Just to mm. know you're not alone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well said, well said. I'm struck across both your projects of the multidisciplinary nature of your teams. And, you know, forming teams is one thing, but maintaining multidisciplinary team cohesion. What's the secret? Shirley, what's the secret of your maintaining the various stakeholders and players that you mentioned, uh, including the governance that you mentioned from Tala, what's the secret of maintaining multidisciplinary team cohesion? Well, I think having, um, it was mentioned there about trust, mm -hmm. and I think trust in each other as a team. Um, I have worked with Dr. Moore in cardiology for 10 years and as an advanced nurse practitioner, he trusts me, he can trust me to be here. And I have learned then that, you know, um, I, I mean, to be honest, coming out here on my own, it was a bit daunting initially, you know, to lose mm -hmm. all that protection. But I knew everybody was just at the end of the phone. Um, we, we've had great support. Our peers, really. I mean, there was another project here. They're here with me, the Heart Efficiency Service. We support yeah. each other. You know, mm -hmm. you knock on the mm -hmm. door if you have a bit of a concern having the support of admin and then the hospital management. So, I mean, mostly I'm just getting on with this here, um, but I know people are there if I need them because I do believe they trust me to do the best job, to be safe and um, to, to just get on with it, you know? Yeah, um, very good. And, and I think that's really important. And that comes from building your relationships. Um, I think procurement of equipment and everything like that. Again, it's about building relationships. We have been so welcomed here in this primary care centre. It was a completely new environment for me. Um, we're based near a GP practice. Um, every day I'm, I'm having a lunch with public health nurses, physiotherapists. I've learned so much about the community and they've learned so much about the hospital services. Mm. So I think it's been brilliant because for too long we've all been in our little silos and and patients want the community patients yeah. want these services you know they want the mm. hospital when they need it when they're acutely unwell but they yeah. know patients yeah. know they don't need to be going to hospital therefore they say i don't want to waste anyone's time yeah and yeah. that's a dangerous thing when you're talking about chest pain you know mm. so mm. patients want this and um you know i'm just hoping that we'll be funded into 2022 that we can we can continue this service Absolutely. Yeah. Share that hope with you. Mm. Uh, Miriam or Audrey, on that point of um, how do we maintain multidisciplinary team cohesion? Audrey. Uh, I'm sure Miriam is far more adroit than mm. I am, but I think maybe good communication, uh, having a shared goal and a shared purpose. I think one of the, the most wonderful um, expressions came from Miriam herself and she said the reason we do this is for the 800,000 people 
who live in Ireland with this. So always it's the patient focus. And I think when you have a shared goal and a common purpose, that helps. There will always be problems. But I think we've had fantastic leadership in this. I, uh, I cannot tell you how astonished I was when I saw the data um, Professor Galvin produced because um, she was sort of cold, if you like, coming into this space, this headache space. And when, when um, I, I serve on an international board for headache and I'm used to looking at the data from uh, American play, but to see homegrown data, mm. it just, uh, that concurred with what I'd been yeah. hearing at global level. So um, I, I think the multidisciplinary nature of that and capturing it, I, I, I give the credit for that totally to Miriam and Professor Harmon and Helen. Helen has done an enormous amount of work yeah, uh, in yeah. this space. So uh, I think keeping everybody together could be regarded as a success in itself. And I want yeah. to say a special word, if I may, Gronje, to the hospital sites, because there were so many challenges and there were so many, I mean, aside from this incredibly difficult time of, of COVID, but there were so many obstacles and barriers, their persistence and their commitment to this project. I'm sure somebody like Shirley has huge commitment and I'm glad that's recognized too. But the other sites, they gave so much dedication and persistence through very difficult times. Yeah. And I don't think they should go on merited and on um, spoken about today I'd like to pay tribute to them well said Audrey thank you Dr sorry. Galvin sorry I was just going um, so usually I'll come in from the left field with a little bit of a different take but I absolutely building on what the guys have said I think um, the trust and respect is absolutely important but I think we have to also uh, in terms of relationship building call out the paternalism and the inequality that's often inherent in a lot of the medical system and the health system I think we've been really really lucky I agree with, with Audrey 100% that Professor Hardiman has been a consultant neurologist that does respect other people and I don't know that the people you're speaking with Shirley but obviously they, they also do mm. but I think to depend unfortunately on the well-being of the person in authority or in the hierarchical apex is fantastic but they're not always there so I think we need to call out as well the importance of team building and just to get away slightly from that medical hierarchical model to recognize the community the importance of nurses the importance of other healthcare professionals and obviously the importance of medical staff but I think that you know we need Need, if we're going forward and change management we're very lucky to have um well-meaning and, and respectful and trustworthy consultants supporting us but it shouldn't it shouldn't hang on that just yeah. i think yeah. there has to be some kind of systematic systematic understanding of what's what's required and i'll yeah. get off yeah. my soapbox now no no and i think <laughs> you know we we've heard others and i think you know the idea of it shouldn't depend on the goodwill of one or two individual well-meaning and great, you know, consultants or, or senior administrators that the system uh, requires the change. And, you know, in many ways, the kind of evidence that yourself and Shirley has been gathering about what's working, why is it working? What do the patients think about it? What can we do to improve? I mean, it's getting that data, that evidence base. Yeah. That really is what will cement in the change. So it's not just somebody saying, oh, I think that's a good idea. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. It's actually no. And, and Audrey's point is well made. It's not just national practice. Benchmarking that against international good practice uh, is, is, is so uh, important. Listen, thank you uh, so much for the conversation this afternoon. Um, uh, I, I've uh, really um, uh, enjoyed it. Um, and somebody's just come in. One of our attendees is, is saying that they agree with Shirley's comments about community health and diagnostic access, that currently there's an increase in what is called health access anxiety, as well as other anxieties due oh. to COVID. And I think we would all be nodding our heads saying, yeah, and that is probably going to become a very technical term as the evidence base builds behind it, even if at the moment we're, we're just using those kind of layperson uh, terms. Look, thank you. Thank you all. And um, I think the projects today have really highlighted some of the patient impact uh, evidence, new referral pathways as alternatives to emergency department 
access, equipping primary community and voluntary care providers to help patients manage their condition outside of a hospital environment, excellent advanced nurse practitioner led clinics. And I have to say for me, that's been the highlight of many of the projects we have presented here over the last year is the role of advanced nurse practitioners absolutely fantastic. So Thank shout you. out to them uh, from me as the presenter this afternoon. Uh, robust health promotion and prevention, patient education and support, including, as Audrey was saying, the telephone support in the community so that people can manage their conditions maybe before acute episodes uh, mm. occur. We talked about collaboration, multidisciplinary, combining in-hospital expertise, primary care, the role of GPs, the pharmacy, the psychologists, and voluntary organizations. And we just mentioned one here this afternoon, the Migraine Association of Ireland, all of those working for the benefits of patients and all leading to timely diagnosis, timely assessment, and timely care. Much of the interventions are leading to emergency department and hospital avoidance. And I don't know which one of you is saying, you know, basically people only want to go into the hospital when they really need to go into mm. the hospital. I think we're surely. So if mm. they can come to the community and have their problems sorted there, that's really what, what the public want. And finally, then the one-to-one -one contact and the support from care teams. And I think we heard that uh, in particular from what uh, Audrey and Miriam and Shirley were talking uh, about this afternoon in terms of their teams providing a kind of a continuity of care that really makes a difference to people. So I think our, our viewers will agree that, you know, these are superb projects, all delivering high impacts and improve engagement and outcomes uh, for patients. Uh, many thanks to all of our guests here today, all of our panellists, uh, those who featured in the videos, and thanks again to the Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, TD, for joining us with his message of support at the top of the webinar. Thank you to all the team here who helped produce this session, Rosaline Harlan, Muriel Farrell, Kiri Eustace, Lindsay Dre, Erica Kinsler, Nicole Kiohan, and Tom Duke. You can watch this webinar back or recommend it to your colleagues. It will be available on the Sloan to Care website. Do send us your feedback. The questions we didn't get a chance to answer in the webinar, we will post answers to you in the coming days. For me, Gronya Healy, please continue to stay safe, layer up, get the COVID, COVID vaccine, sanitize your hands, wear a mask, keep your social distance, avoid crowds, and remember to open a window to improve the ventilation if you are mixing indoors. May I wish each and every one of you and your families a, a very peaceful, happy and healthy Christmas. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Phew.